In this video, I'll make the case that the serratus anterior plane block is something that emergency physicians should strive to provide to certain patients with painful rib fractures. As we'll see, it's a relatively easy block to perform, and it's also very satisfying, as it often produces rapid and dramatic results. My name is Michael, an emergency physician uh, from London. I have a postgrad diploma in medical ultrasound, and that is what my upper body would look like if I hadn't eaten so many biscuits. So what is a serratus anterior plane block? Well, it's a nerve block of the plane above serratus anterior muscle. So here are the finger-like projections of serratus anterior creeping forward around the thorax. And here is the sheet-like muscle of flat dorsi. And the serratus anterior plane is the potential space between these two muscles. So a serratus anterior plane block is a fascial plane block. So we inject a large volume of dilute local anesthetic, which then spreads out over a wide area to block several nerves. So you can think of it as like a fascia iliaca block of the chest. So let's describe how you might use a serratus anterior block in a clinical context. So imagine you're caring for a 76 year old male who's fallen from standing height and injured his chest wall. His sats are 90 percent which is a bit off his baseline and you think there's possibly one or two rib fractures on the chest x-ray. So you get a CT scan and the CT shows there are in fact four fractures of the lateral aspects of ribs four through seven. So he still has tremendous 11 out of 10 pain uh, despite oral analgesia and he's unable to take a deep breath or cough. So I've tried to paint a picture here of a patient who is perfectly suited to this block. So within an hour of receiving the block, his pain is down to two out of 10. He's able to cough and take a deep breath. His sats have come up to 94%. He's admitted to the ward. The next morning he has a serratus anterior catheter placed by anesthesia. He's commenced on a local anesthetic infusion and he goes home a few days later, having avoided potentially fatal complications of pneumonia, atelectasis and respiratory failure. But let's take a step back and ask, why even bother identifying rib fractures in the first place? In many places, radiographers will knock back your chest x-ray request if you only write query fractures. It's not considered a suitable indication for imaging. But actually, there's an increasing awareness that it is indeed important to identify rib fractures, especially in frail patients. So many trusts in the UK have started using the stumble score to predict the risk of complications and to trigger consideration of admission and of regional anesthesia. So what is the stumble score? It's also previously known as the battle score, and it's a composite of your age, whether you have chronic lung disease, anticoagulation, uh, SATs, and a big part of the score is the number of rib fractures. So you get a score of three points for each rib fracture. So in our case, uh, our patient would have scored seven for age, uh, two for SATs, 12 for his four rib fractures, giving him a total of 21 which, as you can see from this table, puts his risk of complications at 70%. So clearly, in this group, we need to actively prevent complications. And the most important way we can do this is by providing effective analgesia. So what analgesic options do we have? Well, medications may be enough for some people, but we know that opiates in particular are associated with significant side effects, such as vomiting, constipation, and delirium. A paravertebral block and an epidural, I think of together because they both involve needling close to the spinal cord. They require a high level of expertise and are both contraindicated in anticoagulation. The erector spiny plane block is a relatively new technique. Uh, it's quite similar to serratus anterior in that it seems to be relatively easy, safe, and effective. It does, however, require access to the patient's back, so it cannot be performed supine which can be a limiting factor, for example, if the patient has uh, a suspected or a confirmed spinal injury. Therefore, I think the choice that is probably most suited to the emergency department is the serratus anterior plane block. So this block was originally described by Blanco in 2013. And since then, it's really been taken on quite rapidly. There are lots of different departments around the UK that are using it. It's in the guidelines for several major trauma centers. And in terms of evidence, there was a systematic review earlier this year, 2022, by Nair and colleagues, uh, 
which concluded that it was a safe and effective block. However, they did note that the quality of the evidence was low, so there was only one RCT, and this was only of 60 patients. However, there is some supporting literature from the world of anesthesia. For example, it's used in breast surgery, and also there is a large multi-center RCT currently recruiting in Australia called the SABER study. So the main indication from an emergency department perspective will be multiple painful rib fractures, and it's probably most useful for the antero and lateral ribs between second and ninth ribs. It may have some effect for other ribs, for posterior ribs, uh, and it can also be useful for chest drain insertion. So if your patient needs a chest drain and is stable, you can put it in before the chest drain insertion. It has also been described for other painful chest wall conditions such as abscess, burns and shingles. Contraindications, uh, so local anesthetic allergy of course, overlying infection as usual, and a specific one to chest wall blocks is subcutaneous emphysema. So if there is overlying subcutaneous emphysema, you won't be able to see anything on ultrasound, so you won't be able to perform the block safely under ultrasound guidance. Notice anticoagulation is not listed as an absolute contraindication here like it is with paravertebral or epidural. There are three targets that we aim for, one sensory and two motor nerves. So sensory nerves are the intercostal nerves and specifically the lateral branches. And then the two motor nerves are the thoracodorsal and the long thoracic nerve. And it's actually thought that motor nerve blockade is important for this block because some of the pain from rib fractures could be from muscle spasm. The intercostal nerve runs within the intercostal muscle. The lateral branch emanates around the mid axillary line and then branches itself into anterior and posterior. And here's the same thing from another angle. So these are the lateral branches of the intercostal nerves branching into anterior and posterior. And here are the two motor nerves, the thoracodorsal and the long thoracic, which both run from cephalad to cordad on top of the serratus anterior muscle. This is what it looks like if you inject dye into a cadaver into the serratus anterior plane. Notice that there is good spread both in a cephalocordad direction and also an anteroposterior direction. There are two ways you can position your patient. First with the patient supine and your needle coming down from above your probe. And secondly, with the patient lying on their side with the rib fractures facing up. This second approach is my preferred approach if the patient is able to lie on their side. It's just easier and the way your needle moves on the screen is more intuitive. Ergonomics are of course important for any ultrasound guided procedure. So ensure your ultrasound machine screen is at your eye level, the bed is at a comfortable height and everything you need is within easy reach. So the main specific complication of this block is pneumothorax and the other complications are more generic, so bleeding, infection and failure. In preparation for the block, uh, first check that there's a suitable indication, check that there are no contraindications, take at least verbal consent specifically mentioning the risk of pneumothorax. Make sure the patient is attached to monitoring, have an assistant to aspirate and inject your local anesthetic. And then stop before you block is a philosophy from the anesthetic world to it's an attempt to try and prevent wrong side blocks. So just double check before you perform your block that you are blocking the correct side. Technique. So in general, the injection is made at the level of the fourth to fifth rib in the mid axillary line. However, there is some flexibility here. So if it's more the upper ribs that are fractured, you can go a bit higher. If it's more the lower ribs, you can go a bit lower. Always use in-plane ultrasound guidance. So in this clip, we can see the needle coming in from the left-hand side of the screen like this. If you can, try and identify and avoid the thoracodorsal artery. We can just see it here. It can be quite difficult to see just above where the laser pointer is hovered there. That's the thoracodorsal artery. So just try and identify it. And if you can, just plot your needle path well away from it. And then once you've got your needle in the correct plane, as you inject your local anesthetic, you should see the muscle bellies of latissimus dorsi and serratus anterior lifting off each other. So they should unzip. And this is beautifully displayed in this clip here. And in general, use between 30 and 40 mils of dilute or 0.25% bupivacaine. So we want a large volume to spread out over a large area. Uh, 
Arkham uses a quite handy 30, 40, 50 rule. So if your patient is less than 50 kilos, use 30 mils. If they're more than 50 kilos, you can use 40 mils. So here's an example of a patient with left-sided rib fractures who's lying on his side with the rib fractures up. Anterior is to the left of screen. And the key thing to identify in terms of sonoanatomy is this anterior aspect of lat dorsi. So the latissimus dorsi tapers off anteriorly. And so if you can find the point as it's sort of tapering off into a beak, then that's really useful. And then you either go through lat dorsi or, as you can see in this image, just anterior to lat dorsi. But the key is to find that tapering beak of lat dorsi. And now everything is flipped. So here we're doing right-sided rib fractures. So anterior is to the right of screen. So on this image, we're slightly further posterior. So we can see a bit more of the lat dorsi muscle here. We can see the thracodorsal artery there, but we can still see how lat dorsi is tapering off anteriorly. So again, just look for that beak-like shape of lat dorsi tapering off anteriorly. The amount of really high quality, free open access medical education on Serrae's anterior block is really incredible. Uh, just to pick out three of my favorites, there's the New York School of Regional Anesthesia, which has detailed chapters on every nerve block you can imagine. Core Ultrasound has within it five minutes sono, which has brilliant short instructional videos on every POCUS topic, including procedural and nerve blocks. And Highland EM Ultrasound also has fantastic resources for nerve blocks in particular, and there's a brilliant video of Andrew Herring performing a serratus anterior block in real time. So how do you achieve competency in this block? Well, I'd recommend actually developing your ultrasound guided skills with other more common procedures, such as fascia iliaca block and IV access. If you can become an expert in in-plane ultrasound guidance, keeping your needle within that thin one millimeter beam of the ultrasound, then you know it's quite easy to then just translate that skill up to the chest wall. Knowledge acquisition is not a problem. As I've already mentioned, there's some fantastic stuff out there uh, which you can access freely. Familiarize yourself with the sono anatomy of the chest wall. So if you're a POCUS user, you probably already know a bit about ribs and the plural line, but you might not be so familiar with serratus anterior and lat dorsi. So get to know these muscles, the tapering of the beak of lat dorsi, how the muscles can be much larger in younger people than older people, the direction of the muscle fibers, and then supervision and assessment. I think if you're already skilled at ultrasound guided in plane uh, blocks, then you don't need to do a lot of these before you can become independent. So if you are considering implementing this block at your workplace, then it's of course crucial to work closely with all the relevant teams, particularly anesthesia, and to determine with them the best uh, or most effective pathway at your local institution. So for many places, this may involve you know, ED performing a single shot block with anesthesia, then following up the next day with a catheter and an infusion, but this could vary depending where you work. Training and assessment yeah, should be agreed locally. It could potentially be provided by ED or anesthesia depending on local expertise, but I think some kind of standardized assessment process uh, would be useful to, to maintain minimum standards. Also, a guideline and a checklist for actually performing the block is useful just to standardize care. Regarding equipment, uh, so of course, dedicated nerve block needles are very useful because they appear much brighter on the screen. We also have a dedicated ultrasound trolley, which has everything you need to perform a nerve block, including the local anesthetic, which removes one of the barriers to people actually performing the block. And finally, audit and research. So if you are gonna start doing this block, audit your results, and potentially you could even consider some original research on the topic. Take home points. So rib fractures matter. We know that the stumble score correlates with complications of rib fractures, and in many places is already used as a trigger for consideration of admission and regional anesthesia. From the limited evidence that we have, serratus anterior plane block appears to be safe and effective, and it's also technically quite easy. You know, I would consider it the fascia iliaca block of the chest. And finally, when looking for your needle entry point, look for that tapering beak of lat dorsi, and that will help orientate you to the sonoanatomy anatomy of the chest wall. And finally, a plug for a group I run on a platform called Slack. 
called the POCUS Collaboration. Uh, there's various channels with resources, including on Serratus Anterior Block, checklists, guidelines, etc. So if you would like to join the group, please send me an email at the address below.